Hi guys, Dr. Gillard here. This is a makeup lecture from last Monday where it was Memorial Day and we're way behind so we got to put one of these on YouTube. We're going to talk about atrial fibrillation and we're going to just start get the basics covered on the accessory conduction pathway disorders like Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome, AVRT, uh, etc. All right, so here we go. And this will be on the final. The PowerPoints for this lecture have been posted on Brightspace. So you're ready to go. And this atrial fibrillation is a very important condition. You need to understand this one. All right, so very common cause of supraventricular tachycardia. Remember we talked about all the different supraventricular tachycardias. This is one of them. It's a very common one, too. Uh, the chronically... So these patients usually aren't like they go up. I mean, it could be, but usually they don't. This is not something that's brought on by a hard night of drinking and lack of sleep. It could be, but it's usually not, especially if people have chronic runs of these things. This is usually associated with some sort of uh, structural heart disease uh, like ventricular hypertrophy, secondary to chronic hypertension or ar coronary artery disease in ischemia or restricted cardiomyopathy uh, things like that so uh, bottom line if you have if you've had runs of these things if you battled these for a couple years there's something probably wrong with your heart so it's a clinically significant disease why because this is the number one cause of fatal stroke uh, in the world. It's a big, big problem. And it doesn't have to only be fatal stroke. It could be a disabling stroke. You could be you know, paralyzed and uh, you can have the symptoms of a stroke and that's a big deal. Uh, the If you do suffer from bouts of atrial fib or constant atrial fib, your risk of stroke increases by a factor of five. Why? It's not the arrhythmia itself that increases the chance of getting a stroke. It's what it causes. So if you have a ventricle or an at left atria contracting 500 beats per minute, it basically is just a quivering bowl of jello and it doesn't do anything. So the blood can, can be stagnant in there and it can build up on the sides of the atria or the left atria. And therefore it can thrombose. And once it builds up big enough the thrombosis can break loose and now you got yourself an embolism and that goes through the left ventricle up the ascending aorta and it could go up into the let's say the left the left carotid and it ends up in the brain and now you got yourself a stroke maybe it goes in the aortic sinus and goes in the right coronary artery and now you got yourself a heart attack so we've talked about that wherever these emboli go I mean that's like Russian roulette who knows or like spinning that little roulette wheel you know who knows where the ball's going to land who knows where the embolus is going to get stuck uh, so it's a big deal because of this stroke thing and then there's some research showing that all not only stroke but all sorts of cardiovascular disease there's an increased mortality rate uh, that's from uh, shoe 82 and 83 that's one of our texts that we use uh, those are the references for that there is some evidence that if mom or dad had a problem with atrial fib this is no surprise I guess there's a bunch of genes that have been discovered genes mutations that seem to carry this to the offspring so if your mom and dad had it there's a chance that you could have it as well what is the prevalence of this condition this is not like Marfan syndrome like point zero one percent of the population this is two out of every hundred people under the age of 65 have this condition and if you look at people over the age of 65 it's much much higher in older people some groups are protected African Americans uh, for whatever reason are at lower risk for this compared to Caucasians or people with European descent females all, all have a higher rate of this problem as well and that's the researchers think that's because they simply live longer than males and again this is old age is a risk factor for this what causes this condition 
there's two big causes and they can't and they're probably both in effect I think most of the like Shu put forth a lot of uh, evidence that the remember we talked when was that yesterday about macro and micro reentry circuits and how you can get a vicious racetrack of current running around the the atria that's probably the main cause of this but it's certainly not the only cause of it another really common cause is where you have a irritable ectopic focus in the atria that's like remember the worker bees normally they can't beat the SA node to the depolarization punch therefore they can't run the heart but sometimes they get really really fast and they can beat the SA node and we've talked about that we talked about each right ectopic atrial tachycardia where maybe one or maybe two ectopic foci are running the heart really fast 150 beats per minute or 130 beats per minute running the ventricles that fast uh, but this is different this is typically many many different ectopic foci just kicking the SA nodes butt and there may be 20 of them all over in the right and left atria both so they're all over the place and it's just a depolarization mess in both atria currents are colliding with each other and it's just a complete electrical mess as we'll see okay either one of these phenomena cause the atria to contract incredibly fast 500 beats per minute how does that sound 500 beats per minute is kind of average 450 of 500 we'll go with 500 because it for the test because it's an easier number but if your atria is beating like that and it's contracting all over the place there's ectopic foci everywhere it's just literally a, a quivering bowl of jello and really doesn't work you you lose your atrial systole so you can't feel the ventricles good anymore and it's just a mess quivering bowl of jello here I think this is from the older Garcia book uh, which I really like right that Garcia uh, his newer book is not nearly as good the 2015 Garcia anyway so here's the AVV node so normally the SA node would be up here and it, it uses Bachman's bundle and the atrial internal pathways and you get a beautiful spread of wave depolarization and it arrives at the approach tracks to the AV node which aren't drawn but in this case we have these are all worker bees that have become super depolarizers or super autorhythmic remember that's the official word these have very fast autorhythmacy and they're just whipping the the SA node is just kept getting hit by these currents and it, does, it can't do anything remember once it gets hit by a current it can't it stops its depolarization so uh, we got currents colliding some of them make it through some of them collide and it's just a big mess associations so there's some common associations with AFib uh, myocardial infarction is has a big relation to it in fact in a study fairly recent study uh, the incidence of atrial fib after an acute myocardial infarction 22 percent that's almost a fourth of people who have myocardial infarctions actually get a fib after that because now they have dead regions of atrial tissue and that's perfect grounds to set up a a micro or macro reentry circuit you can get a whirling current around that dead tissue uh, and that's the definition of atrial fibrillation if you do develop atrial fib after myocardial infarction that kind of doesn't bode well for the future uh, the long the five-year outcomes survival rates are not nearly as high people with hyperthyroidism also tend to have atrial fib they could either have the atrial fib first uh, oftentimes the hyperthyroidism causes the atrial fib about 13 percent of people who develop thyroid toxicosis aka hyperthyroidism actually end up getting a fib and that may be what brings you into the doctor is the a fib <clears throat> so the good thing about this if you get your thyroid your t3 t4 thyroxin levels under control then you got a decent chance of getting rid of the AFib so that's great it probably doesn't mean structural heart disease in this case people who have coronary bypass surgery uh, 
let's say they have their aortic valve replaced or their mitral valve replaced or they have a oh I don't know an ASD atrial septal defect replaced about a quarter of them also develop atrial fib after the surgery why because they develop scar tissue from the surgery if you have scar tissue running through the atria or in patches in the atria that's a perfect ground to set up one of those vicious circles of current Okay, just like we explained last lecture. <clears throat> Other associations, <clears throat> hypertension, uh, mitral valve disease, coronary artery disease, which damages the right atria, causes scar tissue. Right atrial enlargement, we talked about atrial flutter last week. Remember that's often caused by people who have like COPD and they've blown out their the right atrium and their left atrium or right and left or they're both the right atrium and right ventricle are stretched out and that makes that tissue very twitchy and it can you can develop a racetrack of current around that so anything that causes and then we said the atrial flutter can progress into atrial fibrillation so that's that's where that connection comes from a wharf parkinson white syndrome 20 20 percent of people with uh, wp W syndrome also developed this almost a quarter again more associations this one you have to be careful if you've never had AFib before in your life you're I don't know 40 years old 50 years old 60 years old all of a sudden you get you an attack of atrial fibrillation you have to be concerned about especially if you had a long airplane ride you know more than four hours or so four hours or more uh, you could have a pulmonary embolism that could be the, the sign the only s clue that you have that you have a pulmonary embolism lodged in your lung somewhere it could be acute pericarditis is another cause of atrial fib uh, so it can be predictors of underlying disease so of course you got to work those up as soon as possible and there's some good old association there's Belushi uh, so holiday heart drinking way too much you, you have a four-week holiday or a week holiday and you you're 40 years old and you drink like the days of old way too much and it makes the heart super twitchy and if you have any prevalence any increased risk for afib that can bring it out it's not it's usually a day or two after you do the drinking too that's called holiday heart and that's not just holiday heart is for any type of uh, arrhythmia not just atrial fib sleep apnea is a new one uh, that is there's some new research sleep apnea is a lot more menacing than we used to think I don't know if I should use menacing but it's a lot more pesky than we used to think it is now there are studies that show people who develop afib they fix the sleep apnea and the afib stops so maybe they're not getting sleep it's kind of like stressing the heart out Okay, what do these look like on EKG? These are fairly easy to spot, at least for this beginner level of uh, ECG. I'm going to keep it real simple, but sometimes it's not so simple to see these. In fact, sometimes you can't see them at all, uh, but m most of the time you can get an idea. So the QRS complexes, they're going to have normal width. What's the normal width? Did we, did we even go over that? I think I have slides coming on that. Um, remember the three by five rule for the PR PR um, interval. So if you cut that in half, three by five. If you cut that to 1.5, 2.5, now you got yourself the QRS dimensions for width. So 1.5 to 2.5 uh, little boxes is are the the norms for that. So the QRS complexes they're going to be normal width but they're not going to be evenly distributed they're going to be all over the place in other words when we talked about PACs premature atrial contractions we talked I taught you how to look at the RR interval uh, the peak of the QRS complex that tip is the R wave that's the RR interval normally that should be perfectly in sync and perfect very rhythmic this one's going to be all over the place so Garcia and uh, Wang, another good book uh, that I use, got a great atlas on this stuff. They both use the term irregular, irregular, I can't even say it, irregularly irregular. So that means that sometimes they're, 
they might go for stretches of normalcy and then they go irregular. Uh, so it's not irregular all the time, as we'll see in an example here in a second. Um, there are two other conditions for this irregularly irregular. Uh, a wandering atrial pacemaker, which is very similar to atrial fib. It's just different ectopic foci pop up all over in the atria, only they're not going at the same time. They take turns. And a multifocal atrial tachycardia uh, is sort of the same thing uh, where this takes off, but it's it hasn't ru risen to the level we talked about eat already. It hasn't risen to the level of atrial fib. Atrial fib is chaos. Uh, and eat, ectopic atrial tachycardia, is more, uh, more controlled. <clears throat> the classic EKG, if you can only pick one EKG finding, you're going to see no P waves. And that's not, I mean, what about flutter? Uh, atrial flutter, there's also no P well, there are P waves, right? There are P waves, but they come rapid fire one after another. This one, you can't even see any P waves. You can't even see any isoelectric line. Um, the P waves are replaced by, it almost looks like a child scribbles, like scribbled, kind of drew a shaky, shaky line. Um, P waves are replaced by not capital F waves. Remember, in atrial flutter, they were capital F waves. Now we have small f waves. These are called fibratory, fibratory waves, fibrillatory, fibrillatory waves, uh, or small f waves. So be careful in the exam. If I put a big F, that means I'm talking about flutter waves. If I have a little f here, those are fibrillatory waves. So very irregular oscillation. Looks like child scrambling. Uh, they're not as organized as the flutter waves are. So if remember, they look, flutter atrial flutter look like a saw crosscut saw sawtooth pattern. Uh, this one is not. It's like a shaky sawtooth pattern. We'll see in a minute. Okay, there's two different patterns or three really because they can mix. We have fine atrial fibrillation, so fine that you can barely see them. Then there's coarse atrial fibrillation, which is easy to see. I'll try to use examples of that for this beginner class. And then sometimes you can have mixes of these two. So here's an example of atrial fibrillation. Uh, so this is a fine atrial fib. And you have to search all the leads to find it. But see how it's, there it is right there. Like a child is just, there's someone with really a tremor. A resting like a Parkinson's patient with a resting tremor drew this and it's shaky. You see it? Shaky, shaky, shaky. That's atrial fine AFib. You can still see the QRS complex normal duration, but look at the RR intervals. This one's maybe an inch, this one's an inch and a half. Maybe that one's about the same and then it changes again. So it's irregularity irregular. I don't know if I like that, probably because I can't, that doesn't roll off the tongue very good. Uh, here is this coarse atrial fib is much easier to see. You almost start wanting to call this flutter, but it's not because it's not pretty like the flutter is. It's still like the, the resting tremor of a Parkinson's patient. And then you can have mixed type of these things. So let's look at a case here. Here's a 43 year old male came into your office with anxiety, shortness of breath. Uh, he was awakened in the middle of the night by a strange feeling in his chest and uh, he became, developed dyspnea, couldn't breathe well, so he doesn't know what's happening. You're, you're in a small town in Alaska, there's no dock until two towns over maybe, so he comes into your office. Or maybe he thinks his, he needs an adjustment. Who knows what he thinks? But here he is in your office. So you get out your trusty 12 lead. You have your CA set him up, or you can set him up yourself. Here's the tracing. What do we have here? Well, the P wave, you, you want to... And I should say that every now and then the chaos will give you a P wave, but it's by complete accident. So you almost want to say, oh, wait. There's a P wave. Maybe this is just a, uh, no, because that, that, then you go over here. No, there's no P wave. And then it kind of looks the same. And then no, it looks deeper here. See, it's just all, it's all a mess. 
so this is atrial fibrillation. Look at the RR intervals. This one is one, two, three, perfectly. One, two, three, one, two, three, and three quarters. This one is one, two, three and a quarter. See, they're all they're all messed up. That's classic atrial fibrillation. Okay, uh, this one uh, was fine. That should be coarse. This is coarse atrial fib. Sorry about that. This is a coarse atrial fib. Try to show you all courses because they're easier to see. Um, another, some more t kind of helpful hints when you're looking at these. Make sure you look in every single one. We, we haven't talked a lot about the precordial leads, uh, but uh, in fact, V1, the very first precordial lead, is the favorite lead uh, for these things to show up in. Or the inferior leads, uh, AVF, limb lead 2, and limb lead 3. Uh, so these are the ones that... But look at every single one of them because sometimes they show up where they're not supposed to. Let's take another one. Here's a 55-year-old. Complains of chronic... Uh, complaints has a history of chronic hypertension. Comes into your office with dyspnea, some presyncope. Not feeling good. Neck hurts. Maybe needs an adjustment. But here he is. So with these complaints, you immediately go, oh boy, we better get out our EKG machine and run an EKG in the sky. And here we go. So uh, you pause the, hit the pause button. Okay, you're back. Did you see it? Did you see it? How about limb lead two, our favorite? I don't see anything there. I mean, other than it's kind of biphasic, so we got to worry about the what? The access. Uh, so we may have an access shift, but let, well, that's not where we're, we're talking about right now. Limb lead one, you can kind of see it, but look at limb lead three. Those inferior leads can be very nice. See the squiggliness? Ah, okay, am I going to blow that up? And AVL, you can see it in AVL. V2, maybe a little bit in V2, but you see some of them you can see it, some of them you can't. But now if I blow it up, you can see that's a very fine... Uh, a fib there. That's a oh, I got these all messed up, don't I? That's a fine, fine atrial fibrillation there. Sorry about that, guys. This is I just kind of went through these. These are all new pictures here. Uh, this is a fine atrial fibrillation. And when I post this video uh, on Brightspace, I will fix this for you. Okay, oh, I guess we are going to look. Let's practice. Remember the mean electrical, the ventricular mean electrical axis? And remember, if I say mean electrical axis, it's understood I'm talking about the ventricle. But let's check it out. So how did I teach you? Look for biphasic. Who looks the, the most symmetrically biphasic? That's biphasic, but it's not so symmetrical. Not so symmetrical. Well, that's pretty close, isn't it? AVF? So let's let's do our little thing with AVF. Is it perfectly symmetrically biphasic? No, it's which is what's the story with that? Pause the video. Think about that cuz this will be on the test. Okay, is it coming we know it's coming perpendicular to the lead, but is it coming more toward the lead or away from the lead? Away from the lead because this is smaller. That's bigger. Uh, so we are going close to perpendicular, but slightly away. Uh, so that was AVF, right? We could I didn't draw it here, but we can draw our T, like I taught you. Draw the T up, which would be perfectly perpendicular, perfectly biphasic. It's not perfectly biphasic. It's heading a little bit more away. So it's it's kind of like AVL here, maybe in between these two. But now we have to say, is it? Is it going this way or is it going this way? We don't know if it's a right axis deviation or left axis deviation. So how about AVL? Will that tell us the story? If the current is running toward AVL, how will the QRS complex be on AVL? Pause the video. Let's look at it. Good. It will be positive. And just to confirm, AVR or limb lead 3 or AVR. Uh, well, these limb lead 3 is over there toward the right pocket. That should be mostly negative, and it is. That should be uh, mostly positive AVL, and it is. See why you got to learn these lead positions? You'll be lost in this class without learning 
uh, all of these positions. AVL is at negative 30, AVR is at negative 50, AVF, uh, the peeper, is right down toward the floor here. Limb lead 1 is at 0. The star of the show, limb lead 2 is at 60. Remember all these things? Left pocket, right pocket, 120 degrees, limb lead 3. Okay, there it is. So we got a slight left axis deviation. What about the ventricular response to atrial fibrillation? If your atria is going an average of 500 beats per minute, are, is that going to pass into the ventricles? Hopefully not, because you'd be dead if it did. Thank goodness for the AV node and for that slow down portion of the AV node. That really saves the day. Uh, so the bundle of Hiss is going to protect the ventricles from this madness. Uh, it'll let some current through kind of sporadically, uh, but it's not going to let all these, you know, thank goodness, get into our uh, get into our ventricle. So just like with atrial flutter, the AV node does not and cannot let all these action potentials into the ventricle or you would be dead. Uh, typically atrial fib in patients who are on no medication, the ventricles run at about 150, maybe higher, 170 beats per minute according to Shu. Uh, the authors are all not way over on this, but it's it's usually a very uncomfortable uh, tachycardia. The range can be way down to 100, though. It doesn't always have to be 100, and it can be dangerous up to 200. On average, it's around probably 160, 170 or so. So uh, do you need to slow that down, or can you just live like that? Why not just let the I mean, we've all had our heart rates going. We're riding a bike. You can get your heart rate up and still probably you might have a little trouble, but you can talk, carry on a conversation. No, you can't let your ventricles run like that. that it has to be slowed down. Uh, not only is it more comfortable for the patient, but you will wreck your heart if you let your ventricles contract at 150, 160, 170 beats per minute. Uh, you're not getting... You're not getting full ejection fractions for one with a heart rate going that fast. And so you're, not only is your body going to start to become a little hypoxic, but so is your heart. The myocardium is cranking like crazy. You're going to start running out of oxygen and your heart's going to start to hurt a little bit. And you're going to start to wreck your heart. And so you you got to slow that thing down. All right, faster ventricle means not good filling. You have decreased cardiac output. Everything I just said, decreased oxygen, especially the coronary arteries aren't going to get oxygen, and you're going to wreck your heart and end up needing a heart transplant if you're a candidate. If you can live long enough once you get on that list, right? It's hard to get a heart nowadays. The patients uh, may have the classic signs of hypoxia, dyspnea, or dyspnea on exertion, they might be a little confused. The brain's not getting enough oxygen. They're not going to feel good. They might be aware of these palpitations and freak out and be anxious on top of that. If it gets really bad, they're going to start getting blue, uh, some whiteness, and then even blueness of the lips and kind of look like they're going to pass out. And I mean, they could even get a stroke, right? If it throws, if the AFib throws an embolism, goes up into the brain. So uh, symptoms can be all over the place. And let's not forget, some people, especially that those who've just uh, had bouts of this and kind of used to it, they may not even know what's happening. Any relation to ventricular fibrillation? Thank goodness. Uh, I don't know if we're going to get to ventricular. We're so hard behind this quarter. Uh, but ventricular ventricular flutter, fibrillation, or even tachycardia, I mean, that's death. Uh, these are the ones you see in the movies where they jump on top of the guy and, and get out the paddles and zap him, you know, dramatically. This is very, very serious. Ventricular fibrillation is, is you can't live probably more than three or four minutes in ventricular fibrillation. So stopping, how can you, what can you do to stop the atrial fibrillation? I don't think you can really do much to stop it, but you can certainly slow it down. The key is to turn on the parasympathetic system. So you can use the techniques to, to stimulate parasympathetic, or you can shut off the sympathetic system with vagal maneuvers. Right? Remember those things? Uh, so that could slow down the ventricle sp response. It's not going to stop it, though. Why won't it stop it? 
because all these all these maneuvers the the Valsalva's maneuver carotid massage they all affect the AV node what is the cause of this tachycardia what is the cause it's above the AV node it's the atria that are going crazy so you can't stop atrial fibrillation but you can slow down the ventricles perhaps uh, by turning on the parasympathetic system uh, specifically all of these maneuvers increase parasympathetic dominance of the heart and that increases uh, decremental conduction it's it makes the AV node even more stingy and more prone to not allow some of these atrial depolarizations to get into the ventricles what are the, vas the vagal maneuvers I think we talk about these if not here they are again carotid uh, sinus massage definitely want to know the how a carotid, a carotid sinus massage uh, does remember you should not never do this bilaterally only unilaterally and because of the new research out by published in the New England Journal of Medicine there is a slight slim chance that you could spark a fatal ventricular tachycardia uh, so I'm not recommending that anybody do this carotid massage should be done in the emergency department where they can where they can zap your heart if you go into ventricular fibrillation it's a it's a long chance but a long shot of this occurring but definitely chiropractors don't do this in your office uh, if you are don't do it anymore because of that article I don't know if I'll get to that but you can look that up in the New England Journal of Medicine and they have a warning about carotid massage okay Valsalva's maneuvers and what is now how does carotid massage work uh, so you're stimulating what you're pushing on the carotid sinus and it's squirting blood so the carotid sinus thinks oh my god his blood pressure is like crazy high so that stimulates the nerve of herring that's cranial nerve 9 stimulates cranial nerve 9 or the nerve of herring and it sends more signal to the vasomotor center of the medulla remember the tiger cage and if it the more signal the more nerve of herring firing goes on the tighter that tiger cage door is closed and the tiger cage can't get out so in other words the sympathetic outflow of the medulla is significantly reduced so now it's not that the parasympathetics have increased from this maneuver but the sympathetics have decreased so the heart registers that balance between sympathetic and parasympathetic is whoa parasympathetics have increased that's because the sympathetics have decreased if the sympathetics parasympathetics increase decremental conduction increases and not as many signals get from the atria into the ventricles and therefore your heart slows down Valsalva's also increases the pressure in the the carotid sinus finger down the throat that like gagging yourself that can directly stimulate the parasympathetic system all right and that will it won't do anything to the sympathetics but it'll turn it'll increase parasympathetics and that same thing I just described so again like atrial flutter this is going to be a question I can see it coming on the test like atrial flutter these are not going to stop the atrial fibrillation they can just slow down the ventricle response by increasing decremental conduction everybody good with that listen to that again if you're shaky on that how can we stop that darn atrial fibrillation then can't do it with with vagal maneuvers uh, first is called pharmacological conversion that's the, always the first choice it's almost always adenosine that they inject in the emergency room um, scary I've had some clients patients go through this even a student went through this and it's a very terrifying situation you feel like you're gonna die it literally stops your heart for a second or two and it, you get this feeling like you're going to die with it and at least that was their experience uh, but it's pretty good at, at stopping halting the atrial fibrillation if that doesn't work then we got to get out the paddles so there's two types uh, they're both called electrical cardioversion or defibrillization or they're both the paddles can be two types of current uh, there is electrocardioversion, which is the easy on the patient one. It uses a synchronous cardio, uh, synchronous type current, which doesn't cause muscle spasm. Low energy, easy to tolerate. The patient doesn't arch off the table like you see on TV. 
If that doesn't work, then you go for defibrillization. That's an unsynchronized uh, cardioversion can also be called. This is a high energy current. All the the intercostal muscles, the pec muscles, the chest muscles are going to go into a spasm. You're going to lift off the table. I don't know if you lift off the table, but it's you're going to go into spasm and be sore the next day from this. Um, so if that doesn't work, then there's nothing you can do. Some people you can't defibrillate it. Make maybe you may be in normal sinus rhythm for an hour or five minutes and it goes right back in. Some people can't get rid of it. Uh, War Garcia, the older Garcia, which again I really like. That print, that book's out of print, but boy, I really like that uh, that book. I wish he would bring that one back. I don't like his 2015 book as nearly as much. Uh, but anyway, he gives you a word of warning about this. Uh, going too quickly to any of the medication, any of the cardioversions. If you run right into that, especially defibrillation, that's going to shock the heck and contract the heart like crazy. What happens if you have a big piece of thrombus hanging in your left ventre or atrium and you shock the heart? It could jar it loose uh, and it could go up and cause a stroke. So Garcia is a big proponent of try all these vagal maneuvers first. Get the heart slowed down. And if you slow the heart down, you can do a CT scan and an ultrasound and look in the left atria to make sure there's not a huge piece of uh, blood clot, thrombus formation getting ready to come out. Uh, then you can treat that without killing the patient. He, said, he, he insinuates that people in the ER go to the cardioversion techniques too quickly and it perhaps re results in some unnecessary loss of life because of it. If you could slow it down, you can get him in a CT scan and scan to make sure the coast is clear. Right? Everything I just said right there. Some other ways after the atrial fibrillase uh, after the AFib is controlled, there are some medications that you should take or can take to prevent it from recurring. Uh, digoxin is classic. You have to be careful, right? We learned this one uh, causes all sorts of arrhythmias itself if you overtake it. So you have to make sure you take the correct dose on that. Beta blockers, metropolol, I really like that one myself. Um, that's a good one. Calcium channel blockers, potassium. Look at all the stars here. It's not that I want you to know all these names, but you should know potassium channel blockers, digoxin, beta blockers, calcium channel blockers. Those are the, you can see the true, the multiple choice question coming, can't you? Which one of the following is not used to control atrial fibrillation? Some other treatments, uh, persistent and permanent types are difficult to treat. Sometimes you just have to worry about the ventricular response and let them run. You can try radiofrequency ablation occasionally it's not the norm but occasionally it's only one crazy fast ectopic focus running uh, let's say in the left ventricle if it is just one focus that's causing all this trouble you can go in and zap it and you might come out of that one pretty good the trouble is if you zap it it's going to create scar tissue and you could actually set up a a micro reentry circuit around the scar tissue so it's not you know 100% guaranteed but you could try that the goal is always to slow down the rate of ventricular contraction okay other treatment increased chance of throwing an emboli patients should be so here's the the other thing you should also when we've all seen the commercials right I've got AFib I have to take a blood thinner anticoagulant um, like Warfin, it's been around forever. Here's the new ones, Xarelto, Eliquis, Perdaxa. I want you to know these. These are going to be, there's going to be a question or two on these. Why? Your chiropractors. Why? Because patients, your primary health care providers, you got to know this stuff. Patients going to come in with a list of medication. And you need to know what they are. Um, so these are all anticoagulants. So make sure you know these if you don't already. Uh, but why are why are they on anticoagulants? Because of their high risk for arterial thrombos thrombus formation or blood clotting. They're blood clots. Uh, 
easily when they go into AFib, and they may not even know they're in AFib. You know, Apple Watches now, uh, you're starting to hear stories about people who were saved. Uh, they didn't know they were in AFib, and their Apple Watch started going crazy, uh, sounding a warning that their heart was out of rhythm, and they went to the dock, and sure enough, they're in AFib. So they're at danger for getting a stroke when they're when you get an AFib. Um, so to to mitigate that, you can be on blood thinners, and a lot believe a lot of MDs believe you should be on these, just kind of prophylactically, just in case your heart goes into AFib. Those of you who are always on AFib should be on these all the time, because your chance is, I mean, much much greater that you could throw a clot and. You know, you're at the mercy of where that clot lands. So there's two management philosophies to atrial fibrillation. There is the control the rhythm, fight it, try to keep the heart in normal rhythm. And then there's another one, another philosophy is forget it. Let the atria flutter, do what it, or fibrillate or flutter, do what it wants. Just focus on keeping the rate of ventricular contraction to under 100. Garcia actually doesn't, she so says, forget the, don't even worry about, just let the atria run wild. Just worry about the rate of ventricular depolarization. No sense of monkeying around, trying to convert the patient to normal sinus rhythm. It increases the chances of throwing a clot, and it's not worth it. What about mortality between these two? You would think that if you can control the rhythm and keep the patient more in normal sinus rhythm they're not going to have they're going to have a better chance of surviving this in the long 10-year outcome say there's actually no difference between the two there's been quite a bit of research on that and the chances of mortality are the same between both of these philosophies uh, so that's i guess why garcia uh, recommends forgetting it let the atria quiver let's focus on just keeping the ventricle normal let's do another one 52 year old female passed out at a basketball game here's her EKG this was get after given adenosine so it's slowed things down a little bit what do you think did the adenosine work first of all what's the heart rate we can go down here and look let's see do we have one it's a little chaotic uh, but I mean most of this is uh, it's like running 150 at least, so it's not, the adenosine didn't work, she needs to go back. But what do you think? What do you see? Pause it. Okay, you're back? Yeah, we see it all over the place. Got another, uh, looks fine here, but there's like a squiggly line going, but here, what, here's, see what I mean by looking at all the leads? Because you're like, eh, is that normal? Sometimes if you have hair on your chest, when you set the leads up, you can get kind of a squiggle like that you're not going to ever get this so let's check that out blow it up yeah you can't even see the QRS complexes on this one but this is definitely this is definitely AFib this is a fine type of AFib got that one right at least heart rate on this guy it's 187 so adenosine didn't work very uncomfortable or was it? Did I say after? That should be before. Yeah, that's the problem. This should be before their patient was administered. These are from the ER. Okay. Now, uh, what happens if the AV node doesn't do its job? What if there's a one-to-one -one conduction ratio? AFib is it's deadly. It'll kill you. I mean, your heart, your ventricles can't rub that, run that fast. And same with flutter. So these are very deadly arrhythmias because of how fast the atria beat. And they're deadly in specifically for people with accessory conduction pathways. We're going to give you an introduction to that here in a second. But those like we've talked about the hole in the fiber skeleton. People with Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome have a hole where there's no, there's no AV node in the hole. The atria de uh, depolarize and the current can, I call it the rebel current, can sneak right in to the ventricle unopposed and start to depolarize the heart. Yeah, how 500 of those a minute, that would be big trouble. So uh, if you do have one of these accessory conduction pathways, the little F waves or the big F waves can cut right through, shoot right through these accessory pathways, run the ventricles 
dangerously, dangerously fast. And there's a there's a electrical remodeling. This is probably too deep for boards, but people who who have been in in atrial flood or atrial fibrillation, their heart gets actually uh, they get a change in the in the heart cells. They become really fast repolarizers. I don't know if it's practice makes perfect. Normally, the wave of depolarization goes through uh, a section of myocardia, and it takes a little bit of time before that section can accept another current. Uh, but people with AFib, their their uh, myocardial cells, their worker bees, they can repolarize really, really fast. And we don't still know the whole workings of that, but um, they tend to these patients do tend to have a quicker than normal refractory period so they can just generate more currents. Super deadly again, we kind of said this, very fast ventricular contraction can spark some bad stuff, right? Ventricular tachycardia, ventricular flutter, ventricular uh, fibrillation. I mean, you, you die from this stuff. Causes myocardial ischemia, uh, very, very bad. Let's just introduce now, that's the end of AFib. Let's just introduce now to, uh, to the accessory conduction pathways. So again, that QRS duration, uh, that rule, that's the 1.5 rule we talked about in that last section. Uh, so a normal QRS, the width of the QRS should be between 1.5 little boxes and 2.5 little boxes. Uh, study tip, as I told you before, 3x5 rule was easy, 3x5 note cards for the PR interval little boxes. Um, this one's just half of the 3.5 three by five little box rule. So it's 1.5, half of three is 1.5, half of five is 2.5. Works out nice, doesn't it? So accessory conduction pathways or ASPs, they're also called bypass tracks, accessory pathways, alternative pathways, uh, AV connections, bypass pathways. What are they? They are a congenital, meaning what? Meaning you're born with a band of conduction tissue uh, which conducts faster than the worker bees does and this tissue is connecting the atria and ventricles without going through the AV node so there's no slowdown mechanism straight shot from atria to ventricle or from ventricle to atria you can run the other way too so there's two there's two or three we're actually talking about three of them the big one and we've talked about this in the past are the Kent fibers. That's the hole in the fiber skeleton. I talked months ago on this one. Uh, this is an unnatural hole in the fiber skeleton. And if you have a hole in your fiber skeleton that has these Kent fibers, and most holes do, then you have some current sneaking from your atria into your ventricles all the time, and that's called you have a condition and that's called Wolf Parkinson White syndrome. Doesn't mean that you have a super fast tachycardia going on. You could have a normal heart. You could have absolutely no clue that you have Wolf Parkinson White syndrome. We'll talk about that. It uh, looks like I'll probably do that one on Monday and we'll do the lungs on Thursday or Tuesday. Um, but hole in the fiber skeleton filled with Kent fibers equals Wolf Parkinson White syndrome. That's by far the most common. And of course, it'll the current will bypass the AV node. Uh, there's another type uh, called James fibers. The James fibers don't go through a new hole in the fiber skeleton. They use the normal hole where the penetrating fibers of the bundle of His run. They use that same hole. They're smart, but they these fibers bypass the AV node, so they connect to the atria, and they dump right in. Uh, they usually attach to the distal part of the AV node. So they've effectively bypassed the AV node. So that's no good, right? If you have atrial flutter, atrial fibrillation, signals can go down James fibers without any type of, all of them go down there. And so you can die from that one. Um, that syndrome is not as common as Wolf Parkinson White. That one with James fibers goes with Lown-Ganon-Levine syndrome. That's got some 
different EKGs. I've cut that out because I just don't have time, but I do want you to know that name. It's the second most common. Wolf Parkinson White, then followed by Langanon Levine syndrome. These are atrial bypass. These are both forms of uh, atrial bypass tracts, or these are both found. Why is it ASP? It's, it should be ACP, right? I was like, ASP, ACP, uh, accessory conduction pathways. Two most common ones, Wolf Parkinson White, number two is